Hello and welcome to today's edition of the Dance Lab podcast. So today I am joined by a wonderful guest, one that I've had the pleasure of interacting with on a personal level. I'm joined today by Dr. Leandro Lima. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm Great. very happy today. Um, so. Yes? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's yes. the best for a host to hear. <laughs> oh. But um, I'm going to say, you're a lot taller than I thought you were. <laughs> yeah, people usually say that, although I don't feel tall myself in the Netherlands. Yeah, in the Just, Netherlands, yeah. you are... I, I'm average. <laughs> well, I don't oh, know. I, mean, I thought I was average, but I'm a bit short for nah, the I think I'm, I think I'm slightly above average. I'm 191, I guess. The average mm. here is probably 180. Something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. But I mean, I mean, I don't think I could have known that you were this tall because we always interacted across Zoom, yes. which is something that always, I mean, this wasn't a problem last year, but this is a problem now. And I mean, you are a professor at the Erasmus University. And I think didactically, there is a challenge that every teacher is undergoing at this very moment. And I mean, I saw you, you know, uh, adapting quickly to the Zoom environment and how to, you know, work the entire event together. Because essentially, if the teacher doesn't know how to use Zoom, we're all doomed. Yeah. So, I mean, how, what's your experience with Zoom or at least teaching with Zoom? Uh, well, now I'd say that it's fine and I got used to it. But the beginning was crazy, especially because it came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I still remember that. I was going to London uh, to visit my my friend there, and while I was on Eurostar to London, then I got the notification that Netherlands was going into lockdown. I was like, damn, what is a lockdown? <laughs> That's true, actually. That is true. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, okay. I mean, will I be able to go back? I hope so, because I have to teach. And then when I, when I came back, it was already everything online, uh, so it was very sudden, and we are, we were in the middle of term three. So oh. everything that we had planned was for a classroom, not for outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the adapting in the halfway of that term three was on the go. So it was extremely challenging. We actually had no idea what we were doing. No one had Zoom licenses, so our meetings had to be like 40 minutes and then more 40 minutes mm -hmm. until the university managed to get the license for us. So the beginning was quite chaotic, but somehow it worked out because it was just like three weeks or so. Uh, and we were trying to get things more or less resolved for term four, uh, which again was a challenge because again, we only had like three weeks to replan everything on term four into an online perspective. But for this new year, new academic year, I think we learned a lot from our mistakes uh, from before and also from what worked. And I think, hopefully, that it improved considerably what we're able to do. Uh, and I, th I think there are some benefits. Uh, now I see some benefits before I did it. Uh, to the Zoom class, one of them is not having to wake up too early. Uh, when I have to teach at 9 a.m., uh, that, was, that was helpful. But other than that, I actually do like the re recording lectures. Um, and from what I hear, the students like it too. I'm recording lectures now for one course that I do for second and third years, and it's been super fun because I got back into video editing, something I haven't done in a while. Uh, so I'm doing this, lots of editing, some sketches, some funny stuff, uh, which I think they appreciate. I hope so, because it's a lot of work, uh, but it's nice. But teaching on Zoom via Zoom, it's, I got used to it, so I got used to seeing these 24 blocks, blocked faces around my screen. Uh, but you miss the interaction, the face-to-face, -face, like I'm seeing you guys for the first time uh, today, right? On a face-to-face -face basis. I knew you from the screens, so you also look slightly different from, from the yes. screen, right? Uh, and it's just harder to connect to the students, I find, um, when you're just doing online. That's why now when I have the opportunity, I do the first class on campus, like I did for my course, because I can meet some of the students, not all of them, because some are fully online. Mm -hmm. But this face-to-face -face interaction is something that I miss on, on a sharing the same environment makes a lot of difference for the teaching, in my opinion. And that's something that Zoom, as proficient as we can get with it, 
we'll never be able to overcome this this barrier of the first impression. Exactly. Right? Yeah. The first um, impression matters. It matters even more now. I think. <laughs> yeah, even more so. But I mean, that's the thing. It's like I feel like what you said is very profound. That people are now rushing to increase their media literacy by an insane amount. They're all, you know, if you don't adapt, you fall. And that's kind of the feeling that I've been getting from a lot of guests that they they fear that this, you know, this increase in requirements that are based on technology is going to a certain degree where you either adapt or you fall. And that's, I think in teaching that is flawed. What you said in one of our lectures, I still think of to this day, before the exam, you said that moment uh, before COVID where students would scram outside of the exam hall and read notes and share that, that's an important moment, but now it is absolutely obscene to see something like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I feel like the teaching world definitely got impacted on a grand scale. Now I can't compare it to the medical, you know, the medical environment because I think they had it worse, but I think education got impacted a lot. Yeah. But I mean, with this improvement of technology, because I, I think Zoom made the most amount of profit ever in their yes. existence. <laughs> I think Amazon Prime got a lot of money. And that's the thing, when you realize that all these mass media conglomerates are kind of like owning the world more and more, it kind of gives us this, this feeling of, okay, we are eventually going to become numbers. And that's one thing that is super sad. But as media students, it's kind of easier to accept. So my question would be, since you are in the media department, do you feel like you had some ease, I guess, in, in comparisons to other disciplines when it came to adapting to technology? Uh, well, I, I, it's hard to compare with other people because I think proficiency in technology can come from, from different can appear for different reasons, right? I would I always think that people that do like uh, computer science or engineering, they'll be way more technological proficient than I am mm -hmm. because they can actually open this microphone and figure out what is inside and, and stuff like that, which I can't. Uh, I mean, I could study and try to understand, but right now I can't. But the usage of technology, yes, I think to an extent, one of the reasons I ended up going into media studies and I kept doing it, it definitely makes it easier for us to adapt to these technological changes. Um, or at least I cannot, on a subjective level, on a personal level, I can adapt quite quickly. I was actually better at technology when I was younger than I am today. Uh, when I was like, 11, 12, and I, I started tinkering with computers and stuff, I knew way more stuff back then than I actually know now. Also because technology got easier uh, than it was before. Uh, a lot of things that I had to do before to get access to certain things, now I literally just have to press one button, right? Yeah. So I do, I do feel like that it helps. I, with the teaching, for example, I, I would confidently say that we probably did the best job into adapting the meeting department or at least the fastest job into mm -hmm. adapting mostly because all of us already work with media we are somewhat familiar with the media language you know how you have to look at the camera yeah. and have to establish eye contact we kind of know this stuff already because we teach this mm -hmm. uh, so for us it's a little bit easier i find to be able to adapt to these new circumstances of teaching um, so for me, it wasn't that hard. When I decided now, for example, I'm going to re pre-record some lectures for my course, I decided that because I knew I could edit, edit them. I did some internships in mm -hmm. editing before. I once dreamed of being a movie editor. Mm. That's a big <laughs> job, back actually. In the day. Yeah, that, that back in the day. I actually did edit a movie, a short movie back then, but and documentaries and stuff. But, uh, but it's been one about eight, seven, eight years since I last edited anything. So I got it, I got back to Adobe Premiere, which is the one that I like yeah. to use. Uh, so I got back into it, I was like, damn, I actually, do I remember this? And I was so surprised that I, my fingers were moving like they never forgot in the sense of, I knew all the, the shortcuts still, or at least the main ones, like mm -hmm. but buttons, what to press to cut and et cetera, because it remained the same. Uh, so uh, my first edit has been clunky, it took a while, but I don't know, two, three, four videos after, I'm so much faster and I'm kind of back. I know where things are in the new uh, mm -hmm. 
Adobe Premiere Suite, like I know where to find the effects I need and etc. Uh, so I think it makes it easier to edit to edit your own lectures because I mean I, I get to listen to my own audio to my own <laughs> voice for uh, at least an hour and that's the thing it's like I despise it but <laughs> at the end of the day I'm not the one editing them you know so I know my editor loves my voice by this point but I mean to edit your own lectures I mean I bet there's a lot of differences because in a podcast you know it's an easier setting it's a easier conversation whilst there it's like everything you say word for word students will analyze it dismantle <laughs> it and take it as religious claims <laughs> yes and that's one thing that is very interesting is that especially in lectures when I'm watching a lecture I kind of perceive it almost as a podcast mm. because it's a it's a it's almost like a school but you can do it at your own terms if you're mm-hmm. if you keep on track so yeah. I think that is very very cool <laughs> that's one thing that I like yeah yeah that that's definitely one thing that I'm really enjoying is the possibility that maybe we'll keep the, this more or less like it is or make more uh, recorded lectures available to students in the future corona or not uh, because I think it's a very good resource you can go back to it, you can rewatch it, which is much better than just going back to the slides and your notes and just trying to remember things. That's true, but I mean, with the, you know, getting back to the increase, yeah, I mean, yeah. Zoom and Amazon and these companies making literally billions, if I'm incorrect, <laughs> billions <laughs> of dollars in the matter of months because of the COVID situation. But I feel like now more than ever, people are paying more attention to how media or how media corporations affect our everyday life. Mm. And I was watching a very interesting podcast that I would suggest to our audience. It has Tim Pool in it. It's Joe Rogan's podcast. And he has Twitter executives coming in and justifying their actions. I feel like the last time I saw that happening was when uh, Mark Zuckerberg was on trial. You know, and it's something that you bring it back to 30 years ago. I don't think anyone would have ever been accused of, oh, but your, your platform is, you know, proposing these ideas. It's pushing forward this agenda. And now it's like you're on trial. I don't think that would have been possible 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, from what I know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it is very interesting to analyze these things because then companies like Twitter that have 30, 330 million users, they're now being uh, attacked for having a political agenda. And there's a lot of things that go into this. Mm-hmm. And I feel like everyone is kind of getting an opinion on media as a whole and how they function and what they should do. Which is very interesting. I mean, everyone wants to be a media professor <laughs> in their own time, but I don't think we really grasp the power that these companies have. Yeah, I mean, there is a wrong ass- ass- assumption that goes around that media is neutral. There's no such thing. No media is neutral. Uh, all media follows a certain agenda. And I don't say that in a negative way. I say that they have their own beliefs, their own values as a media company or as a technological company mm-hmm. and etc. And those values will surely appear in the products they, they, they put out there, right? So there is this, uh, I, I would rather say, it might be too strong to say that it's a wrong belief, but I do believe that, that it is wrong, that media is neutral, that media, sh- or media should be neutral when it, it won't be. Media is made by humans. Humans are not neutral beings. We are always leaning towards something, right? Uh, and I think that is a damaging belief. And that creates expectations, like yeah, media will behave in certain way. It's not. It's not like that. There's no, nothing is neutral. Exactly. I mean, with something so, it's such a sensitive topic because on media everybody has a say. So at one point you realize that okay, but everybody's allowed to share their opinions and that's one beautiful aspect of media it's almost as though it promotes the ideological belief of democracy almost almost (laughs) but that's the thing when you start thinking that the platform is supplying you with content that promotes something that's when you go in a deep hole and i've ended up in that deep hole several times where i end up thinking that yeah these companies are doing this there's somewhat proof and it's like can we do anything about it Mm. I don't think so. They're a multimedia company that like, <laughs> own half the world. But I mean, at some point, I mean, Twitter, I bring up Twitter because it's a politi- political platform almost. It's a professional platform where people share beliefs. But with Twitter, it's almost as though 
some are punished for sharing their beliefs and some are not, which, as you said, defies the whole point of media. Mm -hmm. However, to go on a different platform, Tinder is one that is very interesting to me because <laughs> it started off as a dating site where people could interact with each other and they could, you know, share their interests, their photos, connect with people that they would never connect to otherwise. So an amazing principle. So introverts could finally show themselves uh, to the outer world. However, I've collected some genuine data <laughs> for this because I genuinely found it really interesting. So I, I did this experiment where if you don't know how Twitter works, essentially you swipe left if you're not interested and you swipe right if you are interested. So I counted the amount of times I have to swipe left in order to swipe right. <laughs> so in total, I swiped around 605 times and that resulted in me liking 20 girls. So in total, out of 605 attempts, I gave my opinion on a positive, uh, positive opinion to 20 girls. That doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. no, because at the end of the day, they have to like me back and the ratio is very low. So to me, when I was doing this, I felt like I was judging, you know, I was judging their appearance, their interests immediately, but it almost eventually felt like a game. And that's what I'm getting at is I don't know if we're monetizing the idea of love. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not a Tinder expert on the theoretical sense. I've definitely used the app <laughs> several times. I stopped using it because I got tired of it. Uh, and several times I used it just as a pastime. It was kind of a game, really. Uh, but I can see that, I mean, the logic is very game-like uh, of just swiping. It's very simple action. Um, but you really have to wait for someone to match with you for things to actually maybe happen, right? Because mm -hmm. after the matching, there is the first message which doesn't always happen or the second message that doesn't always happen um so it's it's tricky like that i don't know it is quite it, i mean from a from a point of view of like a 20 year old when i used it i found myself at one point just swiping left and like immediately i would process the photo that i'm looking at and then make an immediate decision Mm -hmm. without actually, yeah, you know, I'd give reasoning to it, but I don't think I'd give such profound <laughs> reasoning to it. I would just immediately look and then judge according to that. And I mean, it is kind of a game, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it necessarily a game because a, a game needs more rules and certain constraints and kind of an, an achievable goal, which there are some of these elements there, but I would connect it more to play and to pastime and something that has some rules to it and you can do it for fun uh, or you can do it somehow seriously uh, i do it more for fun so i just like pass or i did it with a friend once a, a female friend mm -hmm. and then we decided let's swipe right on all the guys and we got so many matches <laughs> and the weirdest kind of stuff happened <laughs> like so many weird comments most of them not suited for work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. very MPG. Um, yeah, when you when you don't um, you don't select, you don't filter. You just like swipe everyone, especially if you're female. You you get mm -hmm. all sorts of weirdos. So, but we did that for fun. Of course, it wasn't uh, on purpose or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. I would I would be wary of connecting it too much to to a game. Mm -hmm. it has some elements of it, some some logic to it. Uh, but it's more a rating system or a weird social comparison system where you, you try to judge someone by either their appearance or whatever is written there, when there's something written, uh, and kind of try to guess what that person is like based on very few bits of information. <laughs> I mean, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I always compared it to um, gambling in a sense. Gambling, yes. <laughs> because yeah. when you swipe right, you're kind of like betting. <laughs> you know, you're betting yeah, yeah. yourself on the line because it's like, oh, but I like this person. Let's see if she likes me. Yeah, back. and the, 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 just the swiping is a small gamble, right? If you're super like, it's like you're going all in. It's you're easy. spending, if you're on a free account, you're spending like the one super like you have in 24 hours. Like, maybe that person, that is a big gamble. So yeah, connecting it to gambling, I, th I feel like there's mm -hmm. some more connection there. 
And I mean, with the recent updates of Tinder, with the there's new updates that apparently you can become a premium member and have unlimited super likes and yeah. have status. And when you like someone, it tells you these people are celebrities on Tinder. And that, to me, defies the entire purpose of Tinder, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would compare this to the free-to-play gaming scenario where we have the people that are just playing for free and the guys that pay we call them whales mm -hmm. so yeah we have some whales on tinder as well people that will put money in it and then increase their chances of getting someone same as with the free to play games when you actually put money into it and you use this gacha system where you try to get a new character or a new weapon so you spend several resources on it until you finally get what you want it's very similar logic to, I mean, yeah, so, which is a gambling logic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't mean that because you're paying X amount of money, which is a lot of money as far as I remember, uh, it doesn't mean that you get a match or a good match or a date yeah. or anything. It means nothing. Exactly. Right? And there are a lot of dangers to Tinder as well. I recently wrote a paper about the sexual risk behavior of young heterosexual teens in America. It's very specific. Very specific. But <laughs> it's because I found it interesting that people could relate a platform to sexual risk behavior, which can be, to the extent, even being raped, harassed, kidnapped, and so on. So relating a platform to such, you know, they're powerful statements, even just by themselves, just the words are so powerful because they have such meaning, such harmful meaning. But it is a platform that, in my opinion, is supposed to connect people and have people together. And that's the risks of everything, as we said. I yeah. mean, especially with gambling, you can gamble your whole house. I don't think the casino <laughs> cares, you know? It's like the casino will I don't think do they it. care. As, yeah. lo as long as you give them money, yeah. I don't think they and care. And if you win, they'll definitely find you in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing yeah. that I'm certain about. Yeah, I, I still remember Tinder, like when it came out, I don't remember the year. You guys can check. 2012. 2012. Yeah. yeah that one anyway. So 2012, I was still in a relationship, so I didn't use it. But I think 2013, then I, I was single, and then I started using it. Uh, but we're still in the beginning, so we didn't have super likes. Uh, there was probably some way to pay for it, but it was probably very archa archaic. Mm -hmm. And it was quite fun and enjoyable. I actually met a lot of very nice people, like just to go on a date, just to talk or, or anything. Nowadays, it's impossible. If you if Using Tinder then and now, it feels like completely different apps and completely different experiences in terms of how you can meet people and connect with people and etc. Uh, and I think the same goes for other dating apps like Bumble. Bumble is still kind of the one that I feel works a little bit better, at least in the Netherlands. It's the one where I met some more people that were interesting to talk to. And it's an app that gives the power to to women. I don't know if you know Bumble. Uh, I have not interacted with it, but I'll make yeah. sure to check. I mean, I did this for Tinder. Why not for Bumble? I mean. Yeah, yeah. So Bumble is a bit different because Bumble, you like the person, and the, it's the the woman that makes the first move. So if she likes you, she has to be the one to say something first. So she can select you kind of twice, which happens sometimes. They they were drunk and passed mm -hmm. around, and then oh sorry, that was a wrong match. I, I don't want to talk. Yeah. And we can send a first message so there's no chance of harassment for mm -hmm. example unwanted harassment i mean it does i mean you know it's it's one of those topics where statistics come in handy i think it is statistically proven that men are just more likely to send messages that are yeah. either to assert dominance to assert status to assert whatever it is just a human function and i think we've done yeah. it since the very beginning of time yeah. i think an app that acknowledges that and understands that that is the case. I think that that's already one step ahead of Tinder that allows anything, even scamming, catfishing, and so on. Because I think that's essentially what it allows. It do, it doesn't it doesn't allow it formally, but it doesn't condemn it either, or it has a, an algorithm that can protect the user. Yeah. But in regards to media freedom, because that's one thing that I really enjoy talking about is the freedom that people have on media platforms and i think tinder is also a media platform that allows a yes. lot of leeway for sure i mean you can connect spotify you can connect your you can have your description or your photos you can have another feature that i forgot about but there's a lot of side features that allow freedom in mm -hmm. some sense freedom of expression and that's one thing that i genuinely appreciate of media right now but I think there's a debate going on right now about whether people want that media freedom or whether people want just monitored content. So mm. it's rather a debate between freedom and being offended. 
and it's such a it's such a scale. I I love looking at it because it's it's true. Nobody should you know be slandered against or you know be hated or mm -hmm. you know harassed as you said. But at the end of the day, if we limit that, then we limit the freedom of expression that media has always granted mm -hmm. us. Yeah, but that that's the issue with freedom of, of expression. Um, it has a limit. Uh, and that there is again it there is a, a misbelief of freedom of expression being limitless when it in fact is limited so uh, and the limit is when it starts being degrading to other people or when it starts being violent towards other people and penetrating their space of safety and their own freedom of speech right so that that's why it's important for example that these platforms stop the spread of fake news because a lot of this fake news Might, might be related to false information about someone uh, that that yeah, it can cause like several impacts on that person. Um, so it's important that these these courses are put away or are controlled somehow. Same with racist discourses or homophobic discourses. It is important that we filter those out or make them less visible at least. Which doesn't mean that they cannot be said because they will remain there. It's There's impossible to someone. control it. But what platforms can do, and that's what they are failing to do, is to contain the spread of these uh, these kinds of discourses. Um, quite quite the contrary, actually. It seems that they make it more easy to to spread this kind of content. I don't know if you remember when Microsoft. I think it was like four years ago. Microsoft released a bot. Uh, and then they fed the bot with Twitter information. Oh. And in 24 hours, it became like a racist Nazi <laughs> bot. I remember that one. Yeah, it just came to mind. That's true. Yeah. Wow. So I bet it would still be the case. I, I, right now. I'm 100% sure that would still be the case. Mm. Uh, and it's important for us to that, that these platforms inhibit this kind of thing. I'm not saying that they can ban it forever because it's impossible mm -hmm. to, but they can definitely or should definitely think about developing tools where these kinds of discourses do not gain the visibility they currently do. Mm -hmm. That was the other day I saw a video of the the famous Dutch Sunday Zomba Meluba mm -hmm. or something like that. <laughs> Sorry, pardon yeah, my Dutch worried. Dutch exactly. watchers We're not natives, I right. don't have a, I don't speak Dutch. But anyway, he was talking about these conspiracy theorists and etc. And just how, if you create a new YouTube account, like kind of from the zero, erase your IP and kind of mm -hmm. start from scratch as like a new internet user. And you Google just a couple of things about conspiracy theory. Everything on YouTube, on Google, and everything will be about conspiracy theories for you in a very fast way. Uh, and that shouldn't happen because that kind of information is misinformation. It shouldn't be the first one to appear when you type something. When you type vaccine, it shouldn't yeah. be that the first results are about anti-vax um, uh, myths. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it should be statistically... I mean, the, yeah, exactly. There is a lot of leeway, and I think that leeway can be exploited. But to go to play devil's advocate, yeah. for example, <laughs> on Twitter, they were expressing how their algorithms cannot prevent um, even hateful speech because the user will always outsmart the machine, as they say. So they say that, for example, in the comment sections, there will be one person that posts a letter and then other users comment letters to create a word. And the algorithm mm -hmm. cannot prevent that one, which yeah. is, you know, the human mind. Humans can get creative out of proportion. I mean, oh, we yeah, get it all yeah. the way here. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I, I totally agree with that. If there is one thing that we are good at is uh, creating tactics that will subvert whichever kind of power is put upon us. So if, if there is some regulation, there's some power, power structure that's trying to say do it in a certain way, we will find ways to do it otherwise. Exactly. And that's right? an amazing part of humans, <laughs> right? We, we have developed as a species to understand the algorithms we set around us and go around them in yeah. some way, which is at the same time amazing, but also a discrepancy to our <laughs> in the individuality, I guess, because I mean, there's one more question that I really, it's always been on my mind. <laughs> it's always <laughs> been on my mind because it's something that was raised uh, last year. Like uh, I heard it in a lecture and I thought nobody would do that. But there was this question that was, would you rather pay 
a small amount per month to use specific uh, applications rather than sell your data. That's essentially what the debate is about. So their example was, would you rather pay five euros a month to use Instagram? And then Instagram is monitored, everything is 100%. It's a product that you pay, like Netflix. Mm -hmm. So they can't air shows that are, for example, child pornography or something crazy like that. They would never do it because it's a paid content. However, I don't personally think my generation would ever pay for media. I don't think that's one. Th I mean, unless they rebrand the entire thing, but it's such a far concept to my mind because we pay for Netflix and that's already okay. We are allowed, you know, we allow that. We pay for Spotify, which is music. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was growing up, music was free on YouTube. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, you would, actually, my sister would have disc players. She would, buy, you know, buy the CDs and that was the expense of music and that was the exchange. Now I feel like, you know, when Spotify was premium, then people were allowed to criticize it at all times mm -hmm. because they put an in, they had an input in it yeah. and in, you know, they wanted the product to be a specific way. With platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and even Tinder, regular, no, the free version, there, it's kind of like nobody knows what to expect because it's free to some degree. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think the general, the general audience knows that putting an email in is selling data. Yeah, I also don't think so. Uh, I think most people don't really realize that. Um, and I think even if they did, they would still say yeah that that's okay hmm. it's a small price to pay um i don't i would never think that if instagram starts getting paid i don't think it would be a successful model at all i don't think anyone would pay for that and we have a a, a good old example of it uh it's called Flickr. oh I, i've heard i've yeah. heard actually yeah so Flickr used to be like this free website where you could upload photos and people could comment on it uh, and then it moved to a paid version, and I think it kind of died down. It still exists as far it still it still exists because I still have my page there. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't use it, but it was back when I was still doing some freelancing photography. But uh, but then it became kind of something else and kind of died down uh, as a because it wasn't free anymore. So I, d I don't see it working for other networks as well, uh, like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Social networks, they, sh they would never be paid because it, it's not their logic. Even YouTube, even though it does have a paid version, I don't know how successful their paid version is, so I it's might okay. be saying something wrong here. Um, but I would never pay for YouTube. <laughs> never. I, I know that they have some exclusive content and etc. but I'm like, really, do I need... I would much rather pay the Patreon of a creator exactly. that I like than paying a general abstract sum of money to YouTube, which will yeah, not really generate much for exactly. the creator because I care about the creator. I don't really care too much about YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's the platform. It, essentially, it's like, you know, they allow you to interact with, well, or at least they allow you to view people that you would have never viewed before. So they always have this kind of looming power over you that it's like, oh, but this is on our platform, you know? And they really, they really are onto that. However, I was thinking of one, you're, you're right in the sense that I don't think people would pay for a platform where they can share their content, but I think people are willing to pay for a product that, is exclusive. The more exclusive it is, the more oh, people yeah. are willing to pay for it. And I think a great example of that is OnlyFans, which is essentially like a, a porn website, but you pay a lot, from what I understand, for specific users. And I mean, I think the exclusivity of it is what attracted the most amount of people. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. And it's funny because, I mean, OnlyFans, it's probably like 99% used for pornographic erotic content mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily i don't think it was necessarily what was created I for mean, you can be an because, artist yeah because it can work for anything yeah. in terms of content creation like exclusive content creation but i think it was just adopted by the the industry also because it's a safe ish i mm -hmm. guess space for these uh especially erotic pornographic um workers in comparison let's say with other places where they could have their content and then but probably the profit would be lower the safety would be lower mm -hmm. and it's, uh, 
Nice. And that, that was scary. Yeah, that was scary. <laughs> no no that explosion. <laughs> that was a slap. <laughs> that was a slap and a half. Damn. Technology is listening, huh? <laughs> Sorry, guys. I like your technology. I mean, I just, I, I just, I just got a new iPad. <laughs> No, but I, I just got the new iPad. I really like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. I'm a customer. I'll buy everything. Oh man, but I mean, it is it is something so interesting, like exclusivity and how people react to it. It's like as soon as you put a price tag on something and you make it somewhat limited, everybody is gonna be interested. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to an extent, is still up Apple's. Uh, kind of what's what's the word strategy is still exclusive even though a lot of people do have it nowadays but to an extent it's still like you're apple person i'm not a big apple person i actually only like the ipad so that's why i got a new one it's the one apple product that i do appreciate because i think it's super useful and it's much better than other similar things uh but i know people are crazy about apple in terms of having everything and all that so it creates this idea of exclusivity and also a bit of belonging to a family. But you're saying about this exclusive creator content. So OnlyFans is one, Patreon is another, uh, and probably there are other oh, initiatives Lord, yeah. there. Uh, and it is indeed about this exclusivity and also to be closer to whatever, whoever is the person that mm-hmm. you admire or the artist you admire. Parasocial, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Parasocial, Parasocial relationships, relationships. <laughs> yes. Uh, is it, it allows. Although if, in this case we're not even talking about a fictional character most of the time, mm-hmm. most of the time they're real people. They might be going through artistic names, but it's still that person. It's not a character that that person is portraying. Uh, so it is. It is interesting, and I do think I think you're very right in that point that the exclusivity of it attracts, and then people are more willing to pay for it. Uh, I'm still not quite there. It doesn't buy me as an idea. Yeah. I, I, I do support. I do a lot of support to crowdfunding because I like the idea of crowdfunding. It was something I researched mm-hmm. during my master's, so I feel like somewhat a, a connection to, to the practice. But I don't really support anyone on Patreon, for example, even though I do follow several creators that I like a lot. I try to support them in other ways. So I might buy some of their product or I always like the video Mm -hmm. to make sure that there is engagement and all these sorts of things. But yeah, exclusivity, definitely a a characteristic of this new media content that makes people want to pay for it. I mean, thinking about it with retrospect, there's a lot of media creators that are influential. They have around 20 million subscribers as a whole. That's insane. That's a nation. (laughs) You know, you have a nation following you. (laughs) But, for example, they produce a product, they produce a hundred of them. They're aware of what they're doing. They are. And it's a great marketing campaign because it's successful. And a lot of people have this idea that, You know, it's like if you're not giving everybody the equal chance of buying something, then you're not being fair. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I thought about it like this. I thought, well, a store can produce however much they want. It's the lucky customer that gets it. And that's the the essentially exclusivity put to an an extreme. Yeah. Because at one point you realize, okay, but I'm a subscriber like all the other (laughs) 29.999.999 million subscribers. Yeah. Why don't I get the the shirt, the limited edition Mm -hmm. shirt, limited edition? It's crazy. Exclusivity, especially on media, is so obvious and blatant that at one point, it's like, okay, you you either go with the flow or you just stop. (laughs) Because media is just being like that at this point. Yeah, Yeah, no, no, that's true. I actually just thinking still about the creators and their content and all that. Um, it is a strategy to create limited con- limited edition of like t-shirts or etc. I know some creators that actively do that. Uh, so you, you bought it, uh, they, they produce X number, it's, it's over, it's over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I find that interesting because from the point of view of just how influencers connect with their, their fan base, it's it's a very unique way of doing it but it's very similar to what other celebrities have done before but also in a much cheaper scale Mm -hmm. right you're not spending a thousand dollars you're spending 10 20 30 dollars in a t-shirt that only Mm -hmm. has like a thousand of them worldwide or something so it's a fair price for exclusivity different from 
some of these celebrity stuff that you can pay the whole lots of money mm -hmm. for for something, right? Yeah. I mean, what you said before was very profound about what Apple as a it creates this idea of like a group, and I've been seeing it. For example, on Instagram, there's always these memes or posts that are just like, um, "Oh, look at Samsung is objectively faster than Apple," you know. And then there's always the comment that's like, "Yeah, but I'll still buy Apple," you know. And that's yeah, it. Yeah. You're right. There's this idea of like superiority when in reality, if you objectively analyze the products, I think Samsung is outperforming some Apple phones yeah and that's been uh, there's probably a lot of videos about it in comparison in comparison yeah. to the retina and the, the speed the processor and everything but i think this idea of you know status as well mm -hmm. because i think in america especially there's this trends of people putting all their apple products on their table and yeah. it's like why why do you need <laughs> to share that with the world it's like hey guys look at me i i'm not intelligent enough to build my own laptop so i made these i spent all my money on these and I hope you guys think I'm rich. Uh, yeah, but like, if I go, if you allow me to go a little bit into more academia mm -hmm. stuff no, here. For sure. uh, so the, the guy, Henry Jenkins, so he researches uh, convergence theory and fan studies and media convergence and etc. That is one of his books. I can't remember exactly the term now, mm -hmm. but he talks about, about something that's either love brands or love marks, mm -hmm. something like that. But ben, basically, mm -hmm. the gist of it is that uh, people become fans of brands, and Apple is definitely by far the, the biggest example we have of this, but not it's not the only one. There's some people that only wear Nike, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, um, and so on and so forth, as, or just play PlayStation, yeah. or play, just play Xbox, and so on. So you, you can have that with several products, but Apple is definitely the, the main one. Uh, and, but their behavior, their way of thinking, and their way of showing love for this brand is very similar to how a fandom shows love for Harry Potter or Hunger Games. It's it's not dissimilar in that mm -hmm. sense. It's still about consumption, uh, but of course it's a different uh, money that is invested, time that is invested. Uh, I would say that the, uh, f the Hunger Games fandom is probably more creative than the Apple fandom. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's probably more fun fics about yeah. Hunger Games and there is about Apple, but I might be wrong about that because no, yeah, I, I mean, never doubt that. Point, but <laughs> <laughs> at this point, I'm imagining Steve Jobs, like there's definitely a subreddit about uh, yeah. that. <laughs> there's probably some fanfic like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak as a couple <laughs> and uh, they, they got babies, they, all the babies are called I babies or something yeah. like that. If, I mean, uh, that's not, now that you're saying <laughs> it, I think definitely there's definitely. Well, there's some. definitely there. I mean, it's Route 34, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna be there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I still find it amazing how, for example, what you said about Nike or Nike for those who call it that. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's amazing because they have people that are already famous, people like Drake. And on this time, I'm correct on that one. <laughs> Drake, in, in one of his songs, he says, checks over stripes, that's what we like. And checks are the Nike and stripes is Adidas. Mm. But I do think that this rivalry is what makes these two brands so big. Nobody has yeah. Reebok or, like in this debate, <laughs> it's not Adidas and Reebok, it's Adidas and Nike. Oh, yeah. And it's the same for Apple and, you know, Windows, for example, and uh, how people compare platforms all the time. So TikTok and Instagram or all those, there's always rivalry. But when brands choose that rivalry, I think it's all a marketing scheme. Yeah, can be. I mean, you try. It's usually because they have a similar uh, target audience. I mean, for PlayStation yeah. and Xbox, that one is, I think, the, the oh, best yeah, that, example. That's a big I problem. mean, the audience is the same. The vast majority of people that play either one or the other have played one or the other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's that's an it's, that's going to be a never-ending debate, and that's something that always happens in games. So before you guys were born, mm -hmm. the the debate was Super Nintendo or Mega Drive's last Genesis. What about Atari? Uh, <laughs> before the, uh, Atari was like there was only Atari at the time, that's basically. True, I mean, true. but I wouldn't be surprised if there were some fights between Atari and ColecoVision people and all that. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe there is. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely, for, when I was growing up, there was a lot of thing between ah, who has a Super Nintendo, who has a Mega Drive or Genesis, because mm -hmm. uh, the names were different in different countries. Um, and then it moved on to actually PlayStation and 
uh, Nintendo, so it was Sony and Nintendo back at the Nintendo 64 era. Uh, and then when Xbox came into the, into the gaming scenario, then it became PlayStation and Xbox as the main competitors. And you have Switch there just being happy, and you have the PC, uh, PC gamers just being superior. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that one is one thing that I will say. It's like, look, my PS4 takes flight every time I, I turn it on. It just starts. It sounds like a Boeing 737 <laughs> about to take off. So that's a fact. All right? I think everyone who's owned a PS4 can say that. And Xbox One probably has the, the problems, you know, its own problems. Yeah. But one thing that always made me support this theorem is that PlayStation and Xbox release their their platforms, their new gen platforms, on the day. The same. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that they they talk to each other and do that on purpose, but it is definitely they see that one's gonna do it, the other's gonna do it. There's a pressure from the communities themselves, mm -hmm. uh, so from the Xbox people, from the PlayStation people. When there's the new one coming, uh, will it be better? Will it have a 0.1 faster yeah. processor than the <laughs> little <laughs> rivals and and stuff like that so there is this expectation and then it's just the market market logics as well so if your competitor is releasing a new one you need to release a new one and and then just using the nintendo again kind of nintendo goes on its own timeline right exactly. ah we released switch like was last mm -hmm. year two years ago i don't remember uh when it was kind of towards the end of the generation of PlayStation and Xbox, but considerably before PS5 and... What's the name of the new Xbox? Oh, it's uh, called the uh, Gen... Xbox. What's the Xbox, the new Xbox? I think it's Generation X. I think it's Generation yeah. X. Xbox yeah, they has... Even. They have... Ter I mean, it's hard. <laughs> X Microsoft people, you're terrible at naming yes, your consoles. They, they, they don't really make are. sense. So yeah. it's hard to remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Xbox 360 was the best one, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah so I, I now, have it. And I like mm -hmm. it. Xbox, but the, no, the Xbox, Xbox One X, Xbox One S. No, but, no, no, that one no, is, the but one one is the previous one. No, uh, it, no, no there's 360, and then there's one, Xbox and then there's the new one. Uh, so it's 360, Xbox One. And then like Xbox Gen Z, or <laughs> Gen Z. <laughs> call it, like there's they gave it some crazy name. Th nah. There's no name to it. I mean, that's see, bad marketing. Bad Microsoft. marketing. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft. that's really If bad we can't marketing. remember the name of the console, that's bad marketing. PlayStation has it easy. Mm -hmm. Z, no, two, three, four, five. Makes sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. Xbox, Xbox 360, Xbox 360s, Xbox 360e, Xbox One, Xbox One S, Xbox One X. Xbox Series X. Series yeah, that's X. it. It's Series that's X. That's the new one. That's what it is. I even, I even see. I even forgot what I was gonna say about it. Mm, that it's uh, <laughs> essentially. Oh yeah, one thing though about these, it's like they. I don't know. It feels to me like they do talk to each other because they're such, they're such powerful companies. No, no, yeah. I mean, that's definitely. Because there is a lot of industry events as well, like GDC and so on, where people yeah. do meet Games and Con. talk. All that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have all these industry-wide events, and definitely people know each other. You have people that transfer from one company to mm -hmm. another. That That's the normal part of, of the industry. And I'm sure they set their calendars somehow in a, in a similar manner. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't doubt that. Mm -hmm. I find funny that Nintendo has like this... Kind of they do that things in their own time and that's it uh but they're super successful with switch so that's they're definitely doing the right thing so i mean they really they really revolutionized gaming as a whole just by releasing so many good games on this platform that is not revolutionary on its own but when you yeah when you see how it's built and the uh, the ability to play with other people just by you know tearing it apart you yeah. have two controllers you're allowed to play mario kart whenever and then they release a zelda breath of the wild you know, it's like, damn, relax. Yeah. You know, there's so many good games. So many. So many. Yeah, that is kind of strange. Then you think about, it's like, oh, PS4 and how Xbox One, or all these names at this point, <laughs> I'm not bothered to remember all yeah. of them. But, like, these companies are kind of, like, under scrutiny all the time. And especially after they release the new generation consoles, they are a lot... They are under a lot of pressure because the PS4 fans say that it looks like the Pope's hat, <laughs> and and then other the Xbox fans say that it looks like a you know it's like a heating device like a fan a futuristic fan that just shoots air, <laughs> and it, it's crazy. But like from my point of view, 
it's like companies that create a product that millions, if not billions of people are gonna use. And they think of this design, they have this design, they go through with it, years go by, they, they have this design, they release it, and then someone's like, yeah, it looks like the Pope's hat. I'm not gonna buy it. Yeah, but that's, all, <laughs> that's always gonna happen with any product. You can't, not, not everyone's gonna like it. But people will buy it even if they don't like it. Mm -hmm. Because, especially in the case of video games, what really matters is the softwares, right? Uh, we know for a fact that at some point there will be a PlayStation 5 Slim, right? Yep. And an that, E That's or something. the logic. <laughs> then there will be an Xbox Series XY mm -hmm. and then something. We know that down the line they will streamline it because technology will evolve and they'll be able to make it smaller with the same capacity, mm -hmm. if, not, if not greater. That's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that's going to happen. We know that not everyone's going to like the design. But the brand is already well established. Games.